Merry Christmas. Did you ever wonder why we say Merry Christmas? Why? You know, <laughs> I'll tell you in just a second. <laughs> yeah, if you think about it, we say Happy New Year, Happy Fourth of July, Happy Birthday, Happy Groundhog's Day, Happy Thanksgiving, but we say Merry Christmas. Well, it wasn't always that way. Um, in fact, in the 1800s, we used to say Happy Christmas. And it wasn't until Charles Dickens... Um, you know, the guy that wrote the Christmas Carol, he popularized Merry Christmas. And so we started in the 1800s to say Merry Christmas. But that's not the case all over the world. Uh, In fact, over in England, Queen Elizabeth doesn't like the term Merry Christmas. Um, She, you know, in the proper English, she thinks Merry sounds too much like a party or too jovial. So in England, they still say Happy Christmas. At least the upper crust people um, say Happy Christmas over there in England. But regardless, uh, whether you're saying Merry Christmas or Happy Christmas, you know, the sentiment is pretty much the same, right? We want to wish you a Merry or a Happy Christmas. We hope that things that, you're, that, that are happening around Christmas are going to go well, that you get your Christmas shopping done, that you have uh, a great, you know, uh, good time at, at church. And, and that sounded kind of weird, but, uh, you know, that you get to go to church, that you get to spend time with your family, the things that are happening to you are good, that you travel well and see your relatives. But the reality is, is that not all Christmases are happy. Not all Christmases are merry. If you are in that situation where you're having a happy Christmas, thank God for that, truly. Thank God for a happy or merry Christmas. There will be times in our lives, and there may be times for some of you here today, where Christmas is just a little bit less than happy. You know, there's people here that are are suffering with loss. There's people that are suffering with um, medical issues or uh, maybe just this past year that, you know, life just kind of got flipped upside down for you, a job or a relationship or something like that. My guess is there's even a couple people in here that didn't want to come to church this morning because they didn't want to be around all those happy Christmas people, you know. So, But you know what? I get it, but more importantly, God gets it. You know, in here, it's not all about happy Christians. You know, there's people in here that suffer loss. There's people in here that have sores on their bodies, that have leprosy, have blindness. They didn't know what cancer was, but back then they probably had that. They were stoned. They were widowed. They were sold into slavery, cheated on, imprisoned, died of diseases, and were killed. Now, does God want us to be happy, though? Yeah, sure he does. In fact, that's why he gives us scripture so that we have guides and rules to keep us away from making those decisions that are going to make us unhappy. But he doesn't promise us that we're going to be happy. In fact, in John 16, he says, in this world you will have troubles. And in Acts 14, he says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. But you know, this is where joy comes in. You know, on the surface, joy and happiness sound very similar. And they're not, you know, complete opposite sides of the coin. But there's definitely a difference. Happiness is our response to what's happening around us. It comes from the old English word hap, which means good luck. So if things around us are going well, we can be happy. You know, after service today, if the Packers win, some of us will be happy. Some of us might not be, but some of us will be happy. Um, So it's external things, whereas joy is something that comes from inside. And specifically, Christian joy is something that we see inside. So it is possible to have joy and not have or not be happy. You know, as a pastor, I've had the privilege of uh, officiating a few funerals for some great Christian men and women. And those funerals are just full of joy, but there's still sadness there. And on the flip side, you may know people that they're just they're lacking that joy, but they can go out and find happiness. They can go to a uh, you know to a, a brewer game, or they can go to you know a family get together, and they can find happiness. But they're still missing that joy that's down inside. So what we're going to do today is that we're going to take a look at what Scripture says about joy. We're going to look at three Scriptures today. 
First, we're going to take a look at the beautiful part of the Christmas story. So if you've got your Bibles, you want to get, the, get those out. We're going to take a look at, at the Christmas story, specifically the part where the angels show up to the shepherds, tell the shepherds about the baby Jesus, and then they take that hike into uh, Bethlehem. We're going to see how joy came, really did come to the world through the birth of God's son, Jesus. Then we're going to take a closer look at joy. We're going to look at Galatians 5. And this is where joy is described as a fruit of the Spirit. And then we'll wrap up with God's word to us through the Apostle Paul in Philippians, in Philippians 4, where he gives us some very practical advice on how we can keep that joy and stay away from things that will rob us of our joy. So if you've got your Bible apps or your Bibles, uh, get those out. And we're going to be going through. Those are the, the three verses or the three sections of Scripture we're going to go through today. So we'll start with the Christmas story in Luke, Luke 2. Uh, But to do this, let's put yourselves in the shepherd's shoes. Or I should say sandals. Let's let's put yourself in the shepherd's sandals for a minute. The shepherds were out just outside of Bethlehem. They were in the fields watching their flocks. Now that's not a real exciting, you know, job at that that time. It's at night. The sheep are pretty much kind of settled down for the night. They do have to watch out for anybody that's going to come and steal their sheep or a, a, a wolf or anything like that. But for the most part, they're, they're hanging out there. They're talking with their other shepherds. You know, they might be telling jokes or talking about how the day went. Uh, shepherds had this uh, shepherd's flute. It kind of sounds a little bit like an Irish tin whistle. Uh, just a nice, calm melody. So that's the setting that we're, we're getting into here. And then let's take a look. Verse 8. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So here these guys are. It's nice, calm, and all of a sudden, boom, there's an angel. Glory of the Lord shone around them. Now Luke doesn't tell us what that glory of the Lord looked like, but we can just imagine big bright light. You know, back in the Old Testament when the the Lord showed up, people fell down on their face. It was just, wow, here's an angel. And they were filled with great fear. The angel of the Lord said to them, Fear not. That's a good way to start. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Great joy. And the Greek word here is kara, which means rejoice, be glad, full of joy. Bring that up just simply because that's going to tie into Paul's um, scripture in Philippians in just a little bit. So I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger. Okay, so there's, again, the angel saying, today great joy has come to this world because born to you in the city of David, do we know what the city of David was? Bethlehem, right? Yeah. So, and they did too. The shepherds knew, hey, the city of David was Bethlehem. It was born a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be assigned to you, a baby wrapped in swaddling claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly, with the angel, was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. So here we have it. God came down. Jesus came down as a baby, and that was joy. And then he he also gives us peace. So we've got joy and peace in there. But I want to point out just two more, two words. We'll go back just a few to verse 11. That baby was our Savior and our Lord. So when these shepherds heard this, Verse 15, when the, the angel went away to, and went into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Come on, guys, let's go to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste. They ran, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And, when they, and then when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. So they told the people there, hey, the angels showed up to us and said that this is joy to the world. This is our Savior. This is our Lord. And there will be peace on earth. 
And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Now they didn't wonder like, whoa, what did the shepherds tell us? No, they wondered like, wow, this is really happening. But then verse 19, and this is one of the sweetest verses, I think, in Scripture. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Do you have any idea what, how, I mean, to just to describe that, the closest thing I can come to is when we, when Pam and I had kids, and when that little baby is first put, you know, when, when Pam was able to hold that little baby for the first time, and she was able to smile, and, you know, my, my wife was absolutely exhausted, but she got that joy of having that little baby in your arms for the first time. That's what I picture that. So then the shepherds, they returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had seen. So they didn't just keep that to themselves. They went out throughout Bethlehem, back out into the fields and said, hey, this is what's, this is what's been happening as it had been told to them. So if we believe that, if we believe that Jesus is our Savior, then he's not only there with the shepherds on that first Christmas. He was born on that first Christmas. He lived his perfect life in our stead, was crucified, died in our place, rose again from the dead, and then when he ascended into heaven, he left his Holy Spirit here with us. So Jesus has been here, came 2,000 some years ago, and has been here with us since then. God with us. And that's where we're going to take a look at the next passage. So let's go to Galatians 5. We're going to look at 22 and 23. This is the passage that describes the fruit of the Spirit. Let's read that here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. There's those two words again, joy and peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So the fruit of the Spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. It's the byproducts of having Christ living inside of us. We can't obtain the fruit of the Spirit without His help. Are you guys tracking with me there? Without Jesus, we can't have joy and peace. We can't have true joy and peace without Jesus Christ in our hearts. As I mentioned, I had the privilege of officiating several funerals for some great Christian men and women. But I've also had the extreme challenge of ministering a funeral whereby all, every indication, that individual was not a Christian. And that was the toughest thing I've ever done as a pastor because there was no joy or peace. So I want to just take a minute right now, actually, and if, ask you, if there's anyone in here that doesn't have that joy and peace of Christ down in their heart, why don't you give yourself the best Christmas gift ever and just open your heart up and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Amen. Church, would you pray with me? Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son. Lord, and for the peace and the joy that we have. Lord, I want to pray for for anyone who hears my voice, whether they're in here or they hear me online. Lord, if there's someone that's eager to have you, to have that joy and that peace in their heart, Lord, I pray that they would, just along with me right now, would just say, Lord, come into my heart. I want that joy and that peace. And Lord, I pray that you would just start a new thing in their lives. Be with them, Lord. And Lord, we love you. It's in your name we pray, amen. The next passage is actually just is, uh, directed to those of us that are Christians. And even if you're that, even if you just accepted Jesus Christ in your heart 12 seconds ago, and if you did, hey, let me know afterwards. I'll, I will hug you. I will high five you. I will do whatever I can to get you, you know, encourage you along that along that journey. But whether you've known Jesus for 20 years 
or 12 seconds, this next passage is for us. It's for how can we keep joy in our hearts. And he gives us some very practical advice to that. So let's take a look at Galatians. Uh, we read in Galatians already. At Philippians 4. Uh, we'll start at verse, uh, verse 4. So right here, Paul is writing to the Christians in Philippi. He's in prison in Rome, potentially facing the end of his life. And yet he writes to the Philippians. He encourages them to rejoice no matter what. So let's take a look. First word there is rejoice. And this is just to tie it back to that, that, uh, that message in Luke. is the Greek word kairo, which is from the same basic uh, fundamental word in Greek. So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness or gentle spirit be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Supplication is just a big fancy word for asking. With prayer and asking, but like persistent asking, kind of like when my daughter wants to go ice skating. It's, you know, <laughs> let's go. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus. So if we just take a look at that. He starts off with rejoice in the Lord always. He doesn't say rejoice in the Lord when you feel like it. Rejoice in the Lord on Sundays and and Thursdays. He says rejoice in the Lord always. And if we have Christ in our hearts, we should be some of the happiest, joyfulest Christians, people that you know, because we've got Jesus in our hearts. And then he says don't be anxious. Does anyone here ever worry? I've got two teenagers now. Enough said, you know. Uh, But he says here, do not be anxious about anything. But we just have to take it to God. We just have to pray to him. We just have to ask him. And then that peace of God. So again, we've got a a couple passages here that starts with joy and ends with peace, just like the shepherds. Joy to the world, and they talked about, the angels talked about peace. Peace to all on whom his favor rests. But then he goes on in verse 8, and he tells us how we can protect ourselves from things that would rob us of our joy. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace, there it is again, the God of peace will be with you. Now, isn't it true that we oftentimes think of things that wouldn't qualify as lovely, true, you know, excellent? Uh, Just a couple weeks ago, our men's group on on, uh, Wednesday morning, we're sitting around, and, and as happens just about every week, we get off topic a little bit, And we start talking about what's going on in the world. We talk about the border wall that's that's not or is or not happening down in Mexico. We talk about what's going on in Washington, D.C. And it was just amazing to to just sense the angst that just started growing as we started talking about this stuff, you know. If you listen to talk radio, it's the same thing. I mean, they make their money off of just getting people... Riled up, yeah. Facebook, I love certain aspects of Facebook. But there's other things. There's people, there's groups that uh, will just rile you up. Um, you probably have that one relative or that coworker, especially right around Christmas, that just gets under your skin a little bit. But those are things can, that can really rob us of our joy because they're not pure, holy, honorable, just, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. So we should train ourselves, we should teach ourselves not to focus on those things. So what things should we focus on? Let me ask you, church, what is or who is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise? Jesus, God, yeah. 
That's what we should focus on first and foremost. And how do we focus on God? Church. Reading scripture. In fact, we've got, Jay, I'm not going to take all Jay's uh, thunder. We've got some great things coming up as far as, uh, as, far as scripture goes. <laughs> uh, reading scripture. Hanging with uh, you know, a life group or other Christian men and women. Um, praying. Praying to God. But you know, there's other things that are also lovely and excellent and commendable. And we should be focusing on those as well. You know, our spouses. Take them out on a date. Spend some quality time there. Our kids or our parents or our jobs, art, music, creation, volunteering. I know a lot of you are, are deer hunters, and you just, uh, I've never gotten to go deer hunting. I'm not really much of a hunter, but I'm a little jealous of that time that you get to spend in that deer stand. <laughs> just out in the crea- you know, quiet creation. So I think the point that Paul's making to us is that we need to feed our minds and our souls properly. And when we do that, we will have peace and joy. So you guys know I like analogies, right? So I'm going to end with a bit of an analogy here. So imagine you just got a brand new car. You've seen the commercials, you know, Christmas time, they got the car with the bow on top of it. Dave, do we have a picture of one of those? There we go. So you've got your brand new car. Maybe it's a Lexus, maybe it's some other car, but it's, it's like perfectly sweet. By the way, has anybody ever gotten a car with a big bow on the top? That's just awesome. I, I think that's awesome. <laughs> so you get your brand new car, you get it home, you go into the, the, the manual of the car, and it says, okay, it works best on mid-grade or premium gas. And as you're reading that, your neighbor shows up with two rusty cans of kerosene, and says, hey, I have these, these been sitting in my garage for years. You might as well just put them in your car and use that. No, right? <laughs> and then your daughter or my daughter or some little preschooler shows up and says, uh, you know, they've got a glass of milk in one hand, a candy cane in the mouth, and a box of crayons in the other. And says, hey, Dad, I want to ride. Or Mom, I want to ride. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe if I wrap you in bubble wrap first and put, put you in there. And then, of course, you go and take your car and you go and park it on 19th and Capitol for uh, you know, a week, right? No, of course we're not going to do that. But yet, how often do we take our bodies and our minds, which the Bible tells us are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we overindulge in food and drinks. This is a challenge, especially this time of year or drugs, legal or illegal, that will harm us. We listen to people and news feeds and social media and watch television or movies that are far from true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, or commendable. And then, similar to parking on the north side of Milwaukee, we surround ourselves with situations or friends that will just drag us down, will suck that joy out of us. The recipe for joy, friends, is is simple. On that first Christmas night, joy came down to the world. He's been with us for the last 2,000-some years. And if we believe in him as our Lord and Savior, joy and peace are going to be two of the fruits of the Spirit that we'll have. And then if we just follow those instructions laid out in Philippians, we can protect ourselves from those things that rob us of that joy. So as we close the service today, um, I'm going to ask our string quartet to come back up. And they're going to play Silent Night. And this song, I heard them practice a few weeks ago, and this song just brought a lot of joy to me as well. Um, But as they're getting set, we're going to do something a little different. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to actually turn to somebody around you, maybe somebody that you didn't ride here with, and just share with them what brings you joy this Christmas. Now, my hope is that Jesus brings you joy. Obviously, that's one of them. That's the big one. But if there's other things that bring you joy, too. So just take a a minute or so and share with the people around you what brings you joy. Merry Christmas, everyone. But more importantly, joyful Christmas. I pray that the joy of Jesus Christ and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
are with you today, tomorrow, and throughout the, this Christmas season. God bless you all. surpasses all understanding are with you today, tomorrow, and throughout the, this Christmas season. God bless you all. Amen.